All right, good morning, Dreamforce. Uh, thanks for letting me kick off your week. Glad that you could make it up early. Let's see if you can make it up this early every day this week after uh, you 2 and the party night. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you about something today that's uh, near and dear to my heart, data modeling on the force.com platform. Uh, my name is Mike Topolovich. I'm an independent Salesforce architect. Uh, I work on a retainer basis with innovative companies that have uh, bought into the strategic vision of Salesforce as a platform to run their businesses. Uh, this is me with my crew. This is my team. We were at the Midwest Dreaming Conference in Chicago earlier this summer. I'm based in Chicago, which is the greatest city in the world, uh, next to San Francisco, maybe. Uh, but I tend to be out here a lot with uh, Salesforce on their, uh, the trajectory that they're on growth-wise. I've uh, been working on the platform as a developer and architect for 10 years, uh, yet I find myself learning something new just about every day. Uh, I've also been given the opportunity to uh, be an instructor for Salesforce University. I teach developers Apex, Visual Force, Lightning. Uh, I'll be teaching some hands-on training throughout the week this week, so you'll probably see me you know, here at the, uh, the Hilton and so on. Okay, so what, what we're here to talk about this morning is designing data models for force.com and striving for something called denormalization. I gave a version of this presentation three years ago here at Dreamforce. I've completely revamped it based on lessons I've learned along the way in my teaching and in my consulting work. Uh, so I'd like to paint a conceptual picture for you of how to think about data modeling with force.com. So we're going to start out by talking about normalization versus denormalization, what it is, how to apply them. We'll talk about the force.com platform, how we work with it. I'll go through some design patterns for data modeling and best practices that we can apply. And finally, I'll, go about, I'll talk about how to apply these design patterns to some design principles, uh, some core principles for data modeling that I've come up with over the years. So if you come from a relational database background, you've probably grown up with the thought that everything needs to be normalized. OK, so what is normalization? Normalization is when you organize the tables and the columns of a database to cut down on dependencies and data duplication. When we normalize, we try and break things down into a level where they exist only once in the database, and then we kind of mash everything back together with a series of complex join operations. And that all sounds good. If you've grown up with that, that sounds like the right pattern to apply to data modeling. But it doesn't quite work with force.com. OK, so why don't we want to do that with our Salesforce database? Because Salesforce is different. You know, As Salesforce developers, you've probably figured that out by now. Salesforce is different than anything you've worked with before. OK, with Salesforce and the force.com platform, we don't get direct access to the infrastructure. Force.com is a layer of abstraction on top of essentially what is a huge Oracle database. Okay, Salesforce manages the infrastructure, the memory, the CPU. They give us access to resources, but again, they don't give us access to the direct infrastructure. Okay, Force.com is a platform. We have to think of it as a platform. Essentially, what it's doing is it's sending instructions to the underlying infrastructure on our behalf. In the old days of IT, we used to own the house, OK? We used to own our infrastructure. We could tear down walls. We could build out room additions. We could do whatever we wanted with it because it was ours. To improve performance, we could throw hardware at the problem. We could throw memory at it. We could tune our databases, OK? We can get away with sloppy coding. But not with force.com, OK? With force.com, we don't own the house anymore. We've traded in the house. We've moved into a high-rise condo. We share infrastructure with all the other tenants in this multi-tenant architecture. Okay, we share the electrical. We share the plumbing. In this case, we share CPU, memory, database. So we have to learn how to live within the constraints, learn, within these four, learn to live within these four walls in order to achieve effective force.com solutions. All right, so as of 
as a platform, force.com create, force creates a layer of abstraction. We never get access to the underlying platform. And then we work with a programming language called Apex, which is, sen is essentially living on top of the force.com platform. And what we're doing is we're sending instructions through to this platform. The platform is figuring out, OK, where do I go to get this from the database? Where do I go to get this from the infrastructure? And it provides that back to us. OK, so if we never get access to the infrastructure, how does force.com actually work? Okay, essentially, what we're doing is we are just preparing instructions. We're saying, I would like to get data from this object in these fields. The force.com platform takes those instructions, figures out how to get that from the infrastructure, and returns it to us in a form that we can use. If you use Apex, you're getting things back in the form of S objects. Okay, we're not getting direct access to the database itself. Uh, if you're just using declarative solutions, you're using queries all the time. You're sending instructions all the time to the platform. If you're just viewing or editing records in the database, looking at list views, reports and dashboards, these are all going to the underlying infrastructure performing complex operations that are completely hidden to you and just giving you what you see on the screen. So traditionally, when we optimized our databases, relational databases, we tried to optimize them for write operations. Okay, normalization made write operations more efficient. With force.com, we need to optimize for read operations. Okay, it's a completely different infrastructure, completely different database structure. Most of what we do in Salesforce is reading from the database. So when we design our data models for force.com, we have to optimize for read operations, not write operations. So denormalization, or the flattening of the data model, will make our read operations more efficient. Just to add a little meat to this discussion, when we talk to the platform and we ask the platform to retrieve our data from the Oracle database, what's happening is we're sending instructions to the platform. The platform is going out and saying, OK, I'm going to find your data in the data table. I'm going to find the accompanying metadata. And I'm going to join all that together and give it to you in a structure that you need. Again, if you're just looking at reports, it's going to give you a tabular structure of your data. If you're looking at Apex data, it's going to give you S objects, key value pairings of your data. So this is a metadata-driven architecture. And you can think about metadata as data that describes other data. Okay, if we have this huge data table, this huge Oracle database table that contains everybody's data, okay, it doesn't mean anything unless you pull that data out and you mash it up with metadata fields, objects, configuration information, so on. OK, so now when we provide these instructions to the platform, the platform has its query plan that it puts together. And it says, OK, I know what, I know what Mike's asking for here. I know what he's trying to get out of the database. I know where it all lives. What's the most efficient path to this data? So the platform goes out and it figures out how to grab your data from the database. And it puts together a SQL, I'm sorry, uh, no, no questions until the end. Uh, after, after the session, uh, I'll be over here, and I'll do a QA over here, but I appreciate it. Thank you. OK, so when we have to retrieve data from multiple tables, when we have to go out to the platform and pull in data and metadata, okay, especially when we're doing relationship queries and pulling in data from multiple objects, what type of SQL operation are we performing there? If I have multiple tables, and I'm trying to gather data from multiple tables and match them up with a foreign key, what do we call that? It's a join. Okay? So the problem with joins, when we talk about the force.com platform, okay, joins, when we go out and retrieve data from multiple tables, it has to figure out, well, what's the best way to do this? What indexes can I use? What's the best path to find this data? But in general, when you think about data modeling on force.com, just remember that joins are expensive. They're expensive operations for the platform to perform. So anytime your query returns data from multiple objects, the joins get even more complex. Okay, joins are happening in places you might not expect. Uh, formula fields, so cross-object formula fields, cross-object workflow rules, complex reports. If you've ever wondered why complex reports sometimes take two, three, four minutes to run, it's because that is an expensive database operation that's happening under the hood. OK, so now in a highly transactional database where you have a large volume of write operations, normalization makes total sense. OK, that's the way we've always done it in the relational world. If, you're, if you have high write operations, normalization makes sense. But now we live in the cloud. OK, we're exposing APIs. We're 
basically optimizing for read operations. And because we're optimizing for read operations, this is why we have to start thinking about denormalization. Denormalization creates a flat data structure where we're creating essentially objects with hundreds of fields. All of our data lives in a single, single object. When we go to query that object, we don't have to traverse the data model and pull in data from multiple objects at once. We don't have to perform these expensive joins. OK, so real quick, let's talk about SOCL. Uh, what, does, what does SOCL stand for? Salesforce Object Query Language. OK, SOCL is not SQL. If you've been a developer for any length of time, you know that. So in force.com abstracts the underlying infrastructure, and Apex is the abstraction of the force.com platform, the language that we use to send instructions to the platform. Sockle is our query language. OK, so Sockle has limitations. Sockle does not support the concept of joins. OK, so when we ask Sockle to perform a query on our behalf, our objects have to have explicit relationships to each other. We perform what are called relationship queries. But again, we're sending instructions to the platform. The platform figures out where all these different objects exist in the metadata table. They find our data. They mash it all up. OK, so another difference between SQL and SQL, SQL is only used for query. OK, SQL is, you know, it supports DML. It supports transaction control. It supports a, a lot of operations. With, with SQL, we're just saying, OK, we want to go into the database pick what we need, and bring it back to Apex, bring it back in the form of S objects. And then we, again, when we talk about data modeling, when we want to perform a single SQL query that retrieves data from multiple objects, we have to perform a relationship query. We have to make sure that everything is connected if we want to have a single SQL query. OK, so as good Salesforce developers and architects, we know that we don't solve every issue with code. We have to take a lot of competing requirements into account uh, when we're designing solutions. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. We're going to talk about data modeling principles that apply to both uh, declarative and programmatic solutions. But before we get into those design principles, I just want to introduce a single overarching goal. Denormalize wherever possible. Flatten your data model wherever possible. Joins are expensive. How do we reduce them? OK, so design patterns. Design patterns, you're familiar with these. They're basically just repeatable solutions to common challenges. OK, our challenges when we design for force.com are much different than in other platforms. OK, so the first design pattern, when you design entities, OK, when you design objects in your database, you want to try and design them in a way that, ex that describes something that exists once and only once in the world. OK, so you are the only you in the world. You should only exist once in the Salesforce database. You have attributes, OK? So as an object, we can describe you. You have attributes. You have a hair color. It could be brown. It could be blonde, red. Uh, Moscone West has a street address, 800 Howard Street. So in force.com, we represent these attributes with fields and uh, with types, OK? Record types, field types, so on and so forth. So if we have objects in the database, we want those objects to exist once, describe something that exists only once in the world. Relationships are what describe how entities are connected. So relationships are going to provide context to describe how two objects or multiple objects are connected. And then we can provide attributes to describe those relationships. So you have relationships with other human beings. You have friends and coworkers, parents, grandparents, significant others. Your company has relationships with other companies, okay, suppliers and partners, customers. So in force.com, relationships can be represented with fields and objects. Okay, we can have master detail relationships. We can have lookup relationships. We can also have what are called junction objects, where we can connect multiple objects together in a many-to-many -many relationship. So understanding how and when to represent entities, attributes, and relationships in Salesforce, that's the crux of data modeling. That's what we have to figure out. Okay, when we sit down and figure out how to meet the needs of the business with a data model, we're trying to put together all these moving pieces. What do we build as objects? What do we build as fields? How do we describe these relationships? OK, 
Okay, so a design pattern uh, that's common to Salesforce is to embrace hierarchy. Okay, so you want to build your data model to be hierarchical. If you want to be able to get data from, let's say, a cross-object formula, if you start at the child level and go to the parent level and grandparent level, those objects have to be connected. They have to be related. So you have to have a hierarchical model. Relationship queries are not the same as SQL joins. They're used to retrieve data from multiple objects in a query. Again, think about it in hierarchical form. Sockle requires explicit relationships. We've already established that. You know, we can go up five levels in a child to parent query. How many levels can we go down? Go down one. Up five, down one. We can use formula fields. We can use cross-object workflows. We can reference data from other objects. We can use roll-up summary fields on the master side of a master detail relationship to aggregate data from children or the detail side. OK, again, master detail relationships enable cross-object workflows. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself on a few of these slides if I'm being duplicative here. And then we can get better report and dashboard data. I mean, if, if we don't have related objects, we're not going to be able to run reports in Salesforce. It's kind of the crux of analytics in Salesforce. So if you go too crazy with relationship queries, if you go too crazy with hierarchy, your performance is going to suffer because you know, we have too many joins we have to perform on the back end. So this is one of the principles of force.com in general. You always have trade-offs. Design for hierarchy. Don't go too crazy with it. How many levels is, is too crazy? I don't know. Ask me over beers later. So just because two objects are children of the same parent doesn't mean they can see each other. I have one parent. I have two children. The only way that two children can see each other is if they have an explicit relationship. So if relationships aren't an option, what's going to end up happening is you're going to write a lot of Apex code. You're going to put things into maps. You're going to have to loop through data structures. You're going to have to do in-memory joins. Again, not having access to joins in Sockle, when, you, when you're new to the platform, you can think about it as a handicap. But if you really learn the platform and learn how the platform works, you'll understand, OK, I, under, I get why this is how it is. I understand that. For some operations, if I don't have a relationship, I have to perform these complex apex operations. Okay, you always want to avoid object sprawl wherever possible. Uh, I've been in organizations where okay, there'd be related objects, maybe uh, representing products. And rather than just using the product, ob product object with record types, they had 20, 30 different objects that all did the same thing that all had similar attributes on them. Okay, learn to love the record type. If you're not familiar with record types, read up on them. Essentially, what they do is they just allow you to segment objects, use them for different purposes, have different page layouts, uh, show different fields to your users, show different values for pick lists. Okay, always avoid clutter wherever possible. Even though you get 500 fields in Enterprise Edition, 500 custom fields per object, or 800 in Unlimited Edition, don't be afraid to use them. But if you're done with them, get rid of them. OK, don't just leave things behind. Don't just leave objects behind. Don't just leave fields behind just because you don't need them anymore. OK, and junction objects, if you learn how to use junction objects, a whole new world will open up to you. Uh, junction objects are really the only way to model many-to-many -many relationships in Salesforce. And I'm not going to get into the technicalities of junction objects versus objects in the middle, master detail versus lookups. I'm just saying you have an object. It has a relationship to one object and it has a relationship to a second object, you can then create records that represent many-to-many -many relationships. Probably use junction objects today without even realizing it. Things like contact role is a standard junction object. It's going to allow you to have multiple contacts on multiple accounts without having to duplicate those contact records. OK, always try and reference data wherever possible, as opposed to duplicating data. I will talk about a couple of use cases where duplicating is actually a pattern that you want to apply for performance reasons. But try and avoid data duplication. Try and enforce referential integrity by having relationships to data, by using formula fields to reference data on other objects, as opposed to copying it down to your object. 
Okay, so there's no hard and fast rules to data modeling per se. These are just design patterns. Now what I want to do is go into some design principles. These are kind of more hard and fast rules, but these are kind of pillars of design that I apply when I go in and design a new data model or refactor a data model. Okay, so these design principles, again, everything at force.com is about trade-offs. It's about achieving balance. You're never going to get things perfect. You're always trying to uh, design things for different purposes, for different use cases, while trying to keep performance up, while trying to make it so that you don't have to write a ton of code to get data from the database. Uh, the first principle I want to talk about is designing for analytics. Okay, with Salesforce, you almost always have to design for analytics in mind. So analytics is being able to find the right data at the right time. How you, how you design your data model impacts how you uh, can organize your data, make it more intelligent, give your uh, business users more insight into their data. Okay, if your users can't easily get to the data that they're looking for, that data is going to lose value to them. So the design patterns that we can apply to achieve this principle Okay, embracing hierarchy. I've mentioned it a few times, but you can create custom report types if your objects are related to each other. You can traverse the data model. You can go beyond the object that you're on to get data from other objects. And again, as a trade-off, you've probably seen with very complex reports, those reports take a long time to run because all those relationships require joins on the back end, so it's a trade-off. Okay, what can we do to improve that performance? Uh, something else that we can do, you know, you've probably uh, seen this in large or organizations with large data volumes. You can copy data to other objects, have that object be read-only, just use it for analytics, use it for reporting. So if I have a complex report that grabs data from many, many objects and it takes too long to run in runtime, you can design a process or an analytics snapshot that will copy that data down, just use it in a completely denormalized data model so that It'll run faster for your users. Okay, designing for user experience. Okay, like with reports and dashboards, if your users can't get to data, it's going to be of no value to them. If all your users see is clutter when they look at a page layout, they're not going to want to enter data. Okay, how many times have you seen an opportunity record with 300 required fields and nobody ever fills it out? And then can, your, can you design a data model to support a workflow, to design a flow that allows your users to naturally navigate through Salesforce, or do they have to click all over the place to find and enter information? Okay, so some patterns that we can apply here. Again, embracing hierarchy. Use formula fields to reference data from parent objects so that it's shown in context. Use junction objects to establish many-to-many -many relationships to describe relationships rather than just adding fields and requiring people to enter data. Okay, how many times have you seen 50 fields on a page? What is the fiscal year you know, 06 revenue? What is the fiscal year 07 revenue? Fiscal year 08 revenue? Put that into a junction object, create new records, and then reference that data. Okay, designing for clicks versus code. As developers, sometimes you know, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you design inefficient data models because you can just write a ton of Apex code to fix that. Well, if your data model's cumbersome, your users aren't going to be able to get analytics. They're not going to be able to navigate through it. So as much as you can write Apex code to fix the problem, it's not going to, it's not going to create a great customer experience, not going to create a great user experience. And again, if your users have to come to you as a developer for everything, sure, that's great for short-term job security, but that's not maintainable over time. It's eventually going to catch up with you. That maintenance, those operations are going to be too much. Okay, designing for security. Are you creating overly complex sharing models by having to manage so many objects and so many relationships? Are you inadvertently restricting access to data that people should be able to see? Are you leaving yourself vulnerable? Are you allowing uh, data to be exposed that should be contained within certain structures? Have data silos popped up in your org because of the unwieldy sharing settings? Okay, I've seen a few orgs where Having these data silos, especially on the account object, which is the center of the Salesforce universe, having these data silos creates duplications because everybody's got to go in and create their own data just to see it. Okay, designing for relationships. If your data model's designed for referential integrity, you can get to your data easily. If it's 
spread out throughout a complex data model, you're going to have to write complex SQL queries to pull all that data into memory and then perform complex in-memory operations to piece it all back together. Now, in some cases, relationships aren't an option or you know, specifically master detail relationships if we want to create a tightly coupled data model. In some cases, it's not an option. And you see this a lot with organizations that are bringing in data from external data sources. You can create foreign keys on objects. You can create external ID fields, and you can use those to perform more efficient queries. You can use it for efficient DML operations. So again, relationships aren't always going to be an option, but there are options where you can model your Salesforce database very similarly to what you're used to with relational data models. OK, create that primary key, foreign key relationship. Uh, designing per for performance, this could probably be a half hour session in itself. But there's a number of strategies you can apply here. OK, are your responses to queries lightning fast, or can you measure them with an hourglass? Is your data model too segmented? Could it use a little flattening? OK, so there's performance implications if you go too crazy with relationship queries, especially in organizations with large data volumes. But designing with hierarchy in mind will provide you with a solid foundation. From there, you can influence your performance with indexes. OK, you can take advantage of indexing out of the box. There are certain field types, especially if you mark a field as an external ID. It'll create an index for you. Uh, many lookup fields. Uh, there's a lot of field types that are indexed automatically. You can call Salesforce support, and you can ask them to create custom indexes on certain field types in your data model. And then a more, I wouldn't call it radical strategy, but a more advanced strategy here is using what are called skinny tables where you can, again, call Salesforce support and say, I have a bunch of fields that are on an object. I want to flatten this out because we read data from this constantly. Salesforce can create a virtual table for you called a skinny table that will allow you to apply denormalization patterns to something that is used often that has performance implications. And then designing for scalability. Okay, is your data model going to grow with you as your company's use of Salesforce grows? Can you accommodate new requests? Or are your hands tied by an object model? Do you have to write code just to get data from your database? Don't be afraid to start over. Okay, there's a, a, I'm finding over the years, I've been doing this for 10 years, I'm finding there's a life cycle of Salesforce implementations. You have the initial implementation where you're just trying to get people to use it. You have a secondary implementation where it's like, okay, I figured out how to use this, now I want to do it a little bit better. You go in and refactor what you did the first time. And then you get to a point where your organization becomes so large, you're trying to decide, do I just throw this out? Do I start over? What do I do with this? Okay, never be afraid to start over. You can always refactor your data model do it the right way, migrate your data, forklift over to something that works better for your current use cases. All right, so we've talked about a lot of things. I know we had a very short time period together, but uh, just some next steps here to take these concepts and these principles and actually apply them and implement them. Uh, Salesforce University has a number of instructor-led courses. Uh, if you want to take the five-day courses, there's uh, Dev 450, which is teaching about Apex and Visual Force. There's a lot of hands-on training here at, uh, at Dreamforce. There's a hands-on training course that will teach you how to think about taking SQL queries and converting them into SQL queries. Uh, that is Thursday at the Hilton, I believe at 3.30 in the afternoon. Developer.salesforce.com. We all know about this by now. We're here at Dreamforce. We figured this out. But there's two white papers that I want to recommend to anybody that's serious about data modeling. Uh, the first one is the force.com multi-tenant architecture white paper. This one will give you the gory details on how the data model is set up, all the different metadata and data tables, how to think about the platform. Because once you understand how the platform works, designing and developing for the platform becomes much easier. Okay, it's much more than just hacking together a data model and creating syntax. Is that for me? All right. I'm almost done. One last slide. And then uh, finally, third-party blogs. I also maintain a blog. Uh, I'm writing a series called Thinking About Apex, which allows developers, again, to figure out how the platform works. Because understanding how the platform works is much more important than understanding the syntax behind the platform, being able to figure out 
okay, here's why certain things happen the way they do, here's why they work the way they do, is going to help you as Salesforce developers. And then if anybody has any questions, as soon as I get the mic off, I'll be over here if you want to uh, do a little Q&A. But uh, thank you for coming. Enjoy Dreamforce. Appreciate it.